Hello again, and thank you for following us. We are in our Bible study here at Creole Church of Christ. When I teach right now, we've been doing Jonah on my weekends. We are in Jonah chapter 4. We have covered the first three chapters of Jonah. Let's see if we'll finish chapter 4. We'll see how far we get. We want classroom participation. Thank you. You can hear the noise in the back. We're all just getting set. All right. Jonah, the fourth chapter. But Jonah, let's read, but Jonah was greatly displeased. Whoa, right in the middle of the sentence. What is happening with Jonah? We come out of chapter 3, where Jonah has preached a sermon. That sermon consists of this. Forty days more, and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's the sermon. I want you to hear it. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. And he went throughout the city, and the people started to fast. They started to turn. The king took off his robes, humbled himself, and he himself covered himself in sackcloth and dust. Do we know of another king who took off a robe and covered himself and humbled himself and put on, took off the royal robe? See, it's a symbol of this king of Nineveh to take off his kingly garment and to take on a servant's role, right? He's humbled under the mighty God. Who was that? Yeah, that's our Lord and our King, Jesus. Took off his royal robes so that he might be the servant, that we might not hope, we hope of eternal life. We live this life as a humble servant of God. All right. So, at the end of chapter 3, we saw that God had saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways. I'm reading chapter 3, verse 10. And God did something. Because they had turned from their, their evil ways, He had compassion on them, and He did not bring destruction on that sin. Okay, very good. I'm just going to read so we're up to speed. You think this would be a good thing? The man preached the sermon. The city repented, but Jonah was not happy. Jonah was greatly displeased. Not only was he displeased, he actually became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still home? What's he referring to? When he first called him, Jonah knew the type of God who was sending him to this evil, violent, violent, country. We talked about the violence of this country. And he says, I knew you were going to do this. That's why I was quickly trying to flee to Tarshish. God said, go this way. Jonah said, what's the farthest I can go in the opposite direction? That was Tarshish. I knew. Now this is an interesting statement about me. I knew you are a gracious and a compassionate God. Huh. Slow to anger bounding of love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life. He is this upset. He says, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Can you, can you imagine? He said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. This is why I ran, yet I, I went on a ship. You sent a storm, they threw me overboard because they said, throw me overboard. You sent a fish, you, you said, you, I survived in the fish by your grace. You spit me up on shore, spit me up on shore. I come in, I do your bidding. I preach this sermon. Nineveh, 40 more days and you will be destroyed. Okay. Jonah. Knows that God is a gracious and compassionate God. Amen and amen. Do we not want him to be? It's interesting. We want him to be gracious and compassionate and slow to anger with me. But that guy, you should get on that guy. We should be glad, more than glad, joyous. We need to look in before we look out. But we do need to look out. There are people in need of God's amazing, compassionate grace. Because if God didn't relent, there wouldn't be anyone to preach to, and this guy wouldn't be preaching. We'd all be gone. But God is slow to anger. Not because he's deaf, not because he doesn't see, but he's hoping 
He's praying. He's reaching like the sermon. He's inviting whether they'll come or not. Okay, so look at verse 4. God has a plan. God had this plan. God's plan was to send Jonah to preach a message in hopes that the city would turn. They turn. So God has tactics. Here's God's tactics. Let's watch God's mind, okay? I know he doesn't have a brain in that sense, but he has a mind. So he says to Jonah, this is you. This is you getting upset. This is you getting upset because you, you said, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew what you were going to do, Lord, and you did it anyway. I was hoping you'd change. I was hoping you wouldn't do what I was hoping you wouldn't do, but you did it. And you get upset. You get so upset, God says, okay, let's talk. Step one, God's tactic, talk to me. Pray to me. Let's talk this out. Get it out. I'm a big boy. Tell me what, tell me what the problem is. Well, I can't get into your situation, but I know I've yelled at him a few times. I remember I had such a situation in life when I was in my early 20s. And I was still a young Christian. Things just weren't going right. I mean, they just weren't. Um, and I wasn't looking for trouble, but trouble was finding me. And I'm like, why me? I remember yelling at the Lord. I was walking. I can tell you where I was. I walked a mile to try to, I think I was trying to get, I forget where I was going. And I, I mean, if you saw me, you thought, don't go near this man. He's one of these crazy people out there. You must have let him out. I'm like, and I'm just yelling at the wind. But I remember that. God wants to hear from me. And he says, tactic one, talk to me. What does Jonah do? Read the next verse. Does Jonah talk to him? The Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? He asked him a question. Should you be upset at me right now? Should you? Yes. I am so mad, I want to die. Just take my life. That's verse three. Have you any right to be angry? Let's talk. What does Jonah do in verse 5? Jonah starts to talk, right? No, he doesn't. Jonah doesn't want to talk to God. God wants to talk to Jonah. Jonah, 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 talk. Lester, would you just talk? No, Lester. Okay, I know you're mad. I know, I know you're mad. Can we talk? Lester, not, not having any of it. I'm going to get a seat. Look what he does. He gets a seat. He's, he doesn't talk to God. He sits down. And what's his hope? What's his hope? Why is he sitting down? What's he doing? Look at what he does. This is the very next verse. It says, Jonah went out and he sat down in a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade. And what did he do? He waited to see what would happen to the city. He's waiting for the city to go down. He said, I'm, I'm not talking to you. I'm just going to sit down. And I'm going to watch because I'm waiting for the city to go down. That's why you sent me, right? You sent the sermon. You gave me the words. And these were the words. 40, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Does you, can anyone look at chapter 3, verse 4? Mine says destroy. Not that it doesn't mean destroy, but does anyone say anything other than destroyed in chapter 3, verse 4? What did you overturn? Overturn. Overthrow. Overturn. Overthrow. Overturn. Overthrow. Overthrow. Mine says destroy. Okay, this was the message. 40 days, overturned. Let's talk. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm, I'm getting my seat. You're coming to 40 days. You said you're going to destroy it. Do it. I know you're a God of your word. Do it. This is what you told me to do. I told him what to say. It, there was no promise. Was there a promise? 40 days, and, and, I'll, I, and I'm going to destroy the city. But if you repent, I, I, I won't destroy the city. Did he say that? No. The sermon said nothing. The sermon said, 40 days, sit down, and wait for it to go. And he got himself, he got himself a front row seat, probably up on a hill somewhere, 
far away so when it blows up, he's not near it. Gets himself, protects himself from the sun, amen. Puts it under shelter, sits down, and he says, all right, Lord, do what you promised to do. Think about that. This is one angry man. One angry man doesn't want to talk to God. You said what you said. Now go and do it. Let me look at my notes. He doesn't talk to God. He doesn't talk to God because I think in my best understanding of this, Jonah feels that God has played a trick on him. It's interesting. Because prior to this, he said, listen, this was my fear, that somehow you wouldn't do what you said you would do. Now go and do what you said you were going to do. The 40 days are up. Let's see. Well, there's a problem. Maybe the word destroy, the Hebrew word that's meaning there, is might be a, a, a word. I'm not saying he didn't say he would destroy the city. I'm not saying that at all. But this, the word means to turn. The word really means to turn or turn over. To turn over, to change. <laughs> Maybe the preacher didn't know what he was saying. And he was saying, 40 days and God will destroy the city. But in this case, because remember, it's just a word. The word can mean 40 days and the city will turn over. Did the city turn over in 40 days? If you think of their hearts, they turn. You know Psalm, is it Psalm 30? He'll turn our, our mourning into dancing. It's the same word, to turn over our mourning into dancing. And what he could be saying, it's just a matter of words, I'm not saying. He's saying, you had me tell him I'm going to destroy them. Not necessarily. I said 40 days and they'll turn over. Interesting. I don't know. I'm just saying. That's why some of yours says turn over or overthrow. But overthrow is a little strong word as well. I'm just throwing it out there from a Bible standpoint. Okay. So, God has a new tactic. God has a new tactic. Verse 6. All right. You don't want to talk. This is God working in your life. You gotta love this. You gotta love this. Let's talk, Tom. I'm not talking. I'm not talking. I'm mad. I, I, I knew you were gonna do this. Okay. Let me do something for you. I'll give you. Let's let's bring some joy. Let's bring some joy. Here's here's God. Here's God. God said, "Okay, I can't get to you. You don't want to talk to me right now. I understand. That. Let me let me provide something for you. Watch what He does. This is a tactic." Then the Lord provided a vine, and he made it grow over Jonah to give him shade for his head to, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was what now? He was very happy about the vine. What do you think? God's working in the heart of Jonah, right? I said, let's talk. We can talk it out. We don't want to talk. Okay. I'm going to give you much joy. I'm going to make your heart happy. Okay? And then there's going to be a lesson. You guys know the lesson because it's coming. Right? So let me help you, Jonah. He made Jonah very happy. Okay. Verse 7. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. Well, that's mean. No. There's a purpose. There's a purpose. He gave him joy. And then he took that job. Now remember, this is a tactic that God can use. Be aware of it in your life. He brings much joy, and then he might let that joy diminish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just want you to grab it. God then sends a word. When the sun rose, mercy, God revoid, uh, provided a scorching wind. The sun was blazing on Jonah's head so that he grew even faint. He wanted to die. That's okay, you wanted to die a couple verses back. Now you're going to die from the sun. It would be better for me to die than to live. 
one of his favorite sentences. This guy has used it twice in the matter of just a short. But God said to Jonah, oh, here it is. Do you, now let's talk. Do you have the right? He had to wake Jonah up. But in order to wake Jonah up and you and I up, he gave him much joy and allowed that joy to diminish. And he had a lesson there for him. And it's a lesson you know and I know too. Because when that joy that you have has been taken from you, and yet the other scenario that was going is what? Now what does God do? Watch God, the mind of God. Now let's talk. And he's willing to talk. Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the plant? Why? You're, you're angry enough to die because a plant that was here one day and was gone the next, you're willing to die. Okay. Yes, I am willing to die. That was unfair of you. It's unfair of you, Lord. You took something from me that I enjoyed. Okay. Is there a lesson there? Is there a lesson there? That's what he's saying to him. Do you have a right to be angry? I do. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, here's the lesson. But he had to wake him up to see it. You have been concerned about a vine. You didn't tend it. You didn't make it grow. It came overnight and it died overnight. You're so concerned about this plant, verse 11. But a city with more than 120,000 people of it who cannot tell their right from their left, meaning they've lost their direction in life. And many cattle too. God loves the cattle. Amen to the cattle. He understands the animals. He understands the people. And he said, and here's the ending of it. This is it. We don't even know what happens after this. The last verse of the book is, God says to him, should I not be concerned about a city of 120,000 people? That's God's tech. Now I want to hear you. I thought it was phenomenal how God approached Jonah, whether he learned the lesson or not. But you got to remember, this book is not about Jonah. It's not about the fish. It's not even about Nineveh. It's about God, his compassion, his grace, his mercy, his slowness to anger, his willingness to provide that which might bring joy. He has a purpose in everything he does. And I love the word provided. God provided a fish, chapter 1, verse 17. God provided um, the worm. God provided the vine. God provided a wind. God provides for a purpose. And that is the lesson of Jonah. We serve a great and awesome God who doesn't always work the way we want him to work. Okay, insights, comments, anything else you see in that chapter, anything from the book, we're going to tie a real good bow around this. And what do you got? Just one comment of observation. Even at the very end, Jonah never went along with whatever God wants him to do. He never said, you know. You know I agree. He never yeah. like, all right, I'm on, I'm on board. Right, right. Three times. Yeah. I am angry enough to die. Kill me now, kill me now, kill me now. And then Jonah repented him. It doesn't say that at all. It doesn't. And I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I can't make it up. I do know Jesus references Jonah for a different purpose. When he says, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man. So he references Jonah as a real life prophet. He was the one and only prophet who went to a foreign nation to preach. Everyone else preached to Israel or, or Judah. And yet, you're right. That's why I say, I think the purpose of the book is not to see Jonah, and it's not even necessarily to see Nineveh, although there's lessons there. It's to see the God that we serve, and the type of God we serve, that would go out of his way to send one of his prophets to a land of people who don't want anything to do with God, 
gives them the opportunity to turn. And Jonah gets mad because he says, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I know the type of God that you are. But amen and amen to us who serve this type of God. Any other comments? So um, observation as we said, a couple of things. Um, with God and Jonah, sometimes we, our sin in our eyes deserves mercy and grace. Other sins deserve punishment. Uh, and the thing with Jonah, Jonah personally taught Nineveh deserve punishment. Yes. But for him, right, he would want God's mercy and God's grace. In, in dealing, in this book, I see God showing us how we deal with other people's sin. It's not about you now, Jonah. This is about me saving Nineveh. Yes. This is about me, right, going ahead and saying, for you, I said, come on, let's, let's reason, said the Lord. Will your skin be like God and be like, what? So, when he talks to us personally, he says, we're going to reason your sin. Yes. And I'm going to do this for your sin, right? Yes. But when it comes to other people's sin, right, that is not your concern. It is my concern is God. And God is showing him, for Nineveh, God is saying, you could be angry. You're not angry when you're asking me to forgive your sin, but you're angry when I'm sending you to save somebody else. And we agree <laughs> like that. We, we look at people and we think that the seasons that people have with sin, we should have to know we should not. Not because somebody's out there sinning, right? And enjoying life. Yes. Right? We should not go preach to them, right? Because we, we have not enjoyed that. There's a reason that God has allowed them to go through those paths and those avenues, okay. right? And he might have saved us from some things, right? So that we will not go there. But if we look at people enjoying life and not in the body, we like, man, they should punish for that. That's right. But then when God sent you to preach to them, you're like, but God, they were, they were doing all of these things. Right. Should they not pay for these things? That's right. That is, they are, that's God's problem to be with. That's, that's the reason to be And I just see the same with similarities with Jonah, right? Yeah. The same thing when God is saying, that's all people say. Let me deal with that. Correct. I can deal with your sin on a personal level. Correct. Life. And on the sermon today, you saw what Jesus did with tax collectors and sinners. Right. They, they were partying. John's disciples said, what, what's this? These guys are going to dinner parties. We're sitting here denying ourselves. He's going to a dinner party, and you're, you're sitting with these people? What's going on? The Pharisees did the same thing. And remember what he said to the Pharisees. We're talking about Matthew chapter 9, uh, verses 9 through 13. Jesus said to him, it's not the righteous who need. What was he talking about? The Pharisees said, get your act together, Lester. Get it together, Joy. Because the Pharisees only called the righteous. They said, when you're right, come be part of the inner circle. You understand? No, you're not. Uh, no, you're not. Yeah, you can come. No, no, you can't. No, yes, you can. No. Do you understand? It's, it's a mirror. That's what was happening when Jesus said, I don't call the righteous. You guys call the righteous. I call sinners. Thank you. So, I mean, that also comes to lies about some things that I've seen in the church. Okay. Um, I know I, I was in India, but my background, some church of Christ themselves have been conservative. As, like some see themselves as liberal and conservative. Sure, sure, sure. Conservative. And to me, it boils down to thou shalt not judge others. Okay. So, like, if somebody comes up and says, Oh, I sit over the weekend and I was caught up in fornication. The next thing is the person will be disfellowship. Okay. I've seen, I've seen it over time. So my perception about this is to what extent do we go about thou shalt not judge others? Because it's, it's it, we see it a lot. Now, we did this on the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. And we showed that in the very next verses that Jesus says, take the log out of your own eyes, spend it. He then talks about judging, right? Don't send your pearls to swine or, uh, that, or something to dogs, right? Don't give to the dog. So he's already making the judgment between who's a, who's a swine and who's a dog. So there are judgments made. I'll give you a hard verse. I'll give you a hard verse. 1 Corinthians, tell me what the difference is between what Jesus did today, eating with sinners and tax collectors, and this verse. And then I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from the Apostle Paul. 
But now I'm writing to you, you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother and is sexually immoral, greedy, idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, don't even eat. What? Didn't I just, what? Didn't I just, what? That's There's, what they, they use, actually. Yes. And they do because it does say. Here's what I would say. It says what it says. It's a man who calls himself a brother. This is what you have to always, oh, this is so good. Anytime you see the judgment on the church, brother, you always have to ask this. Not, don't look at the judgment, although the judgment is important. That's the question. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? You're a brother. You're in the circle. You're acting like you're right out here. Let's, let's just keep him welcomed. Just keeps going. What you want him to do is come back. And if you don't show any kind of, and it's, and it's hard because this is given up to the church, the elders, it, it's not out of meanness or heart. It's, brother, you need to turn around. Your soul is walking away. And if all we do is turn our eyes and say, well, you know, we, we really like him, we just don't bother him. Are we doing him any favor? You could say, yeah, he'll turn on his own. Might very well. But it's a wake-up call. It's a, hey, brother, we love you. But we have to distance ourselves. Right? Distance ourselves. There, I can go on and on. What do you have? The word judgment, if you look, it's just a determination. It could go both ways. You always look at judgments as negative. You, know, and you, you attach a negative connotation yeah. to judgment, right? But if you got a race, think about it. So the Olympics, right? When two athletes are coming to the end of the tape and they're separated by just like milliseconds, what do they have to do? Yeah, the reach. What do you have? They have to go to the tape and see who made it first, right? That's just that judgment. That's just a determination. Now, the only way we can understand where someone stands, as, as Tom rightly said, the purpose, what are we looking into our brother's life or our life to determine, right? If, if we determine that someone needs help and needs uh, nurturing spiritually, right, we will uplift that, right? But we have to some, some way determine if that is needed, right? Everyone will not be fed the same in the church, right? Some people have to get milk, and then some people will get meat, and as they go along, they graduate to the next level, right? But there has to be a point where a determination needs to be made, and that is where the judgment part comes in. But every time we say judge, right, we're thinking a bit negatively, right? And a lot of times we shouldn't do that. Jesus, in Matthew, Peter runs up to him. Lord, how many times have I been? Seventy? Seven. Yes. Seven, seven, right? Seven. He's just thought he was doing that. So I go, he goes, right, and you're going, where is the seven times seven? Amen, brother, amen. But do you see in that same context, you've got to read that chapter, because in that same context, he he talks of, what chapter is that in that? I'm trying to find it. Anyone? I'll show you that. Uh, Anybody with a good chorus? Well, <laughs> I'm good for that. I was to yes, his, please. To his point, if somebody has sinned, or yes. whatever, and they go up and ask to be forgiven, yes. I don't think it's the church's place to, what did they do with that? The fellowship and the fact that you're going up repenting, that's good enough. Even if it's not good enough for you as a person, it's good enough for God, you're repenting. So why would you just God. worship them after them? Oh, no. Yeah. That's what he said. That's the they wanted to disfellowship after he's turned? Yeah, oh, you're kidding. Yes, and here is a fault of the church, I would say, too. Yes. When we, thank you, then I told him this, I Oh, okay, you're right. That, that is a wrong spirit. That is not, you're right. How many times, like, what does he say? If a brother repents, that, that's the stipulation. So if they want to go to that verse, the only reason you disfellowship him is to bring him back. Once he's back, he's in. Yeah. Well, if he's repented, they need to repent of, of, of them yeah. treating him as if he's still a sinner. Yeah. Oh my goodness, if that's what it is, I can rightfully say, I don't know what scripture they're reading. Yes, they need to, to give up. See, this is the problem. Remember I did the whole thing on the Sermon on the Mount? 
And it's the first thing is a poor in spirit. Okay, but we have to realize the poor in spirit, you have to understand your need. But what we do is we set up a false standard when we come through the door. We're having troubles at home, in the car, we're all kind of at each other, and we walk through the door. Hey, brother, hey, sister, how we doing? You know, we're all good. Until we get back in the car. Because there's a certain status you have to keep in the door. That's so backwards. If you can't be forgiven in this door, I don't know what door you're going to have there. Grace is abundant in the church and should be. And the only reason the disfellowshipping or the turning away is only to wake you up to get you back. We just want you to come back. Once you're in, those brothers need to be talking to. I don't know what scripture they're reading. We should be the someone, if they want to confess a sin, confess your sins one to another. No, I'm not going to do that because the minute I do, you're going to disfellowship me. You're going to, you're going to make me a pariah. You're going to say, yeah, we, we don't talk to that brother. Are you kidding me? Okay, all I'm saying is they know their shit. And they want to know we're getting off. But no, that's a whole other topic. That's wrong. So in 1918, you're looking for a 21, right? Okay, but that's fine. So, but there's something I wanted to say quickly about. Um, <coughs> but if, if there's a scripture that says, but if, if someone is ignorant of God, right? Correct. You know, be careful how you do it so that you will not fall into that. Those are, those are the, the things you need to take into consideration when, right, passing um, determinations on people. I don't want to use the word German, right? Because at the same thing, he was spiritual. The Bible says he was spiritual. Do it, right? But be careful that you also right. not fall into that, right? right? So if you don't think you're strong enough to handle that situation, don't dive into it, right? right. Pass it on to another brother that, right? And, and, you know, and there's so many things that we have to make these righteous and spiritual determinations that I look at, right? To make the right decision for the person. It's time for yourself. And remember how they do it. What the scripture said. Right in that 70 times 7, that was my point. Right in that same chapter, he said, if you have a problem with a brother, you go to them. Step one, don't bring everyone else. You go. But if he doesn't repent, what do you do? You bring another. You notice, and I don't mean to be doing circles today, but you go. If he doesn't repent, bring two or three with you. If they don't, Church, you notice how you start to distance yourself? It's like, we're safe. I'm going to go talk to my sister. There's a the problem. Okay, we, that's not going to do I need two or three brothers. I'm, I'm going to step back because we're not going to do this alone, right? Now I'm surrounding myself with others. If that doesn't work, I'm going to surround myself with the church. Understand? So I'm stepping back from you. I'm not coming towards you anymore. I'm actually stepping away with the help of brothers and sisters and back again. And then if not, then we're in the... You're outside. We want you back. See how it works. But once you're back, how do you They need to learn to forget the person. I'm sorry. I got off on that, and I'm not sorry. Bring up any question you want. But that's, that, to me, is the Bible's version of that. And yes, so there's a level of protection when you forgive. So when it says forgive, you forgive. But remember, the brother doesn't repent. There is an action that we have in Scripture, and we're supposed to go to that person. And then take a step back and go to the person again. And take another step back and go to the person again. And then we just step away. Understand? Yeah. Not easy to do. Not easy to do. Okay. All right. Jonah. Anything on Jonah? And we'll wrap it up. I don't know what my next topic will be, but we'll figure it out. Okay. All right. I love you all. Thank you for any comments, any notes, any insights. Let's battle and we'll go. Lord, you are. You are the good and great and awesome God. You are slow to anger, abounding in love, and we depend on that. We know you are also righteous. We also know you are holy. We also know you hold us accountable. But we know that it is Jesus who we will point to in that last good day. For it is not my righteousness which will save me, but it is his if we would but come to him. Thank you for those who are in Christ, we pursue Christ and you have Christ because of the beautiful gospel in which we are saved. We pray for everyone and all that is on their minds and hearts. We pray for his grace and mercy and his kindness. In Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. God love you. Get home safe.